Hello, I'm Brian Walker, Copper Mountain Technologies. Today I want to demonstrate direct receiver access on a vector network analyzer. Um, it's, a, it's a very useful, uh, a very useful option and uh, it's available on our, uh, many of our Cobalt series VNAs. So uh, we'll see what you can do with this. First we'll look at you know, what is direct receiver access, what's it for? So if you look at the VNA, uh, you can see on the front that there's, uh, there are six jumpers. There's the uh, jumper for the incident signal, a jumper for the uh, stimulus, uh, a jumper for the reflected signal, and matching jumpers on the other side. So uh, there they are, so where do they connect? Here's a block diagram uh, of a VNA showing the stimulus at the top and it switches back and forth from port one to port two. Um, imagine it's uh, connected to port one, then the stimulus passes through the source loop as shown here. And that's, uh, that's the middle loop on the left hand side. It then passes through the measurement bridge, which is inside the VNA, uh, and out port one. The measurement bridge separates uh, incident from reflected signals. And so the incident, the measured incident uh, or coupled incident signal from the bridge then is available on the incident loop, which is called ref one here. The reflected signal is available on the, uh, on the reflected lo reflection loop which is called uh, MES1 here on the front panel. We can break into the, uh, the VNA signal path and get at the, and basically isolate the bridge. We can uh, inject signals directly into the mixers. Now the way the VNA works, uh, there's the inc uh, incident uh, stimulus signal here. There's an LO signal which follows it uh, about seven megahertz away on a cobalt such that uh, the, uh, when, when these are mixed together, the uh, incident signal mixed with the LO produces a seven megahertz IF. So the receivers only have to deal with a seven megahertz signal and uh, there's a reflected IF receiver and an incident IF receiver on each side. So we have three loops on each side uh, that will allow us to uh, put the bridge outside the VNA. So we can use another device to separate incident and reflected signals, and uh, we'll see why that's useful. Oh, it should be noted that uh, uh, we can put signals directly into the mixer sections here, eliminating the 20, 15 to 20 dB coupling loss of the bridge. This does not actually improve dynamic range of the VNA because uh, the compression point moves downward as well. So what's it for? Um, so, well, now that we've uh, now that we've kind of shown it, uh, let's actually hook one up. So with direct access to the mixers, uh, we can put a bridge, uh, and we're going to use this coupler. This is a <laughs> bi-directional coupler, uh, 1900 to uh, 4000 megahertz. Uh, it's a 20 dB coupled uh, coupler. And uh, so if I put a signal in here, I'm going to see a coupled signal 20 dB down. Theoretically, I'm going to see nothing here, but we actually will see something. And if I put a signal this way, I should see uh, something here, 20 dB down and nothing here. So this will be my bridge, and I'm going to hook it up to the, uh, to the VNA shortly in order to use it to, as my external measurement bridge. Why would I want to do that? Uh, if you look at the diagram here on the screen, uh, you can see that I, have, uh, I need a preamp to drive my power amplifier. But if I try to measure through the preamp, I'm only going to see the return loss of the preamp. I won't be able to see the return loss of the PA, which is what I'm interested in. So I, will take, I would take this coupler and I would put it between the preamp and the PA and move my bridge to the input of the PA, thereby uh, allowing me to measure the return loss of the input of the PA. And uh, port two would then measure the, uh, the output. So uh, let's, let's do a couple things. Let's uh, Let's have a look at the coupler so we know what we're dealing with. And so I'm connected to the, uh, the VNA now. Uh, let's, um, let's do this. Let's preset the VNA so we start from a known place. Um, and I am going to calibrate the VNA. I'm going to calibrate it only over the range that the coupler will work. So that's 1900 to 4000. 1900 megahertz. 4000 megahertz, and I want a thousand points. See how easy it is to make changes directly on the screen. Then 
then I'm going to use this automatic calibration module to calibrate the VNA. And I'm using this because for two reasons. One, it's very fast. And two, it gives a superior calibration compared to any other method. Uh, if you used a uh, SOLT calibration kit, uh, the results you get from the VNA will not be as good as you get with a v with a automatic calibration module. So I'll attach it and do my calibration, auto cal, two port cal. And it's done. Now I want to measure the insertion loss of this coupler because I want to know everything about it before I start using it. Of course, I'm adding the insertion loss of an adapter there, but I don't have much choice. So the return loss looks pretty good. Let's look at the insertion loss. Add a marker. So the looks like the loss here is uh, is about 0.3 something dB. Uh, so it's not bad insertion loss at all. Let's measure the coupling. Now to do that, I want to load the output so that I don't have a reflection coming back. Now I see the coupling factor is about 20 dB. Uh, I can zero in on that a little bit. So you can see the coupling factor of this coupler is about 20, and it falls off at the two, you know, two ends of its uh, useful frequency range. This is to be expected. Uh, and now let's look at the directivity. Uh, theoretically, if I turn this coupler around and feed it, I should not see any signal on this port. But we will see one. And that's a, a small error, but it's important to, uh, to know what it is. That'll be the raw directivity of my bridge. to load the output here. So now, so now you can see that, um, let's make this minus 30. You can see that uh, I do have an error signal. It's uh, minus uh, 58 or 60 here. So what's important to note, though, is that there is a, there's a coupling loss uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this coupler to begin with, so you need to subtract the 20 dB from this. Uh, what, I should do is, um, what I should do is this. Let's assume for the moment that this coupler is symmetrical. It's a pretty safe bet. And I will... I will go to memory and normalize. And now I've removed the coupling, so, uh, so it measures zero. And now if I go back here, I'm gonna see the difference between the coupling and what I'm actually getting. And this, is, this number is what you would call the directivity. And it's 37 dB here, which is not bad at all. 30, so it varies, but uh, so the raw directivity of this coupler is pretty good. Now, when I use it uh, for a bridge, I'm going to connect it to the VNA and I'm going to perform calibration. Uh, this error will be measured and it will be uh, removed. So there will be uh, some improvement of, of the uh, directivity, the, the effective directivity should be on the order of 47 dB. Uh, it can only be as good, though, as the load that you apply here, because if there's a reflection from this load, it will certainly appear here. 
All right, so we, we know quite a bit about this directional coupler. Let's use it. So I'm going to remove the loops so that I can get it directly get to the receivers. These loops are numbered, by the way, so it's a good idea to, to note that and get them back in the right place. We're going to go to the ref receiver, which is uh, is the receiver which should be monitoring the incident signal out of port 1. These cables are very stiff. Attach that to the port which will measure the incident signal. And then I'm going to go to the reflection receiver. Thread that on here. All right. Now with uh, this plumbed the way it is, this dual directional coupler is now taking the place of the internal bridge of the VNA. So this is my bridge. Uh, so now I'll perform calibration again. And I will, yeah, just attach the ACM. Calibrate. And we're finished. The uh, state you see here uh, doesn't mean anything. It's a kind of random switch setting inside the ACM. I'm going to put the through in so at least we can see a flat line. So with my through in place, I'm measuring 0 .0, 0 0.003 dB. So it, it appears that my calibration was successful. My calibration plane is right here, and this is my bridge now. Uh, what's uh, useful to realize is that I could actually have a, a preamplifier here. I could attach a power amplifier here. And whatever I put here is being ignored because the, this is the bridge uh, and anything that happens before it doesn't count. So this is now calibrated. I could also verify this real quickly by attaching an open. 
and then going to the Smith chart. I happen to know what this open should look like so I can verify that the calibration is correct. S11, Smith chart. And if I go to 3 gigahertz, uh, that is the 115 degrees is correct for this open. It has to do with the delay, internal delay of the open. Um, as you might know, uh, an open on a Smith chart is here at the very right hand side, but uh, a, a CalKit open looks like an arc, a clockwise arc. It starts at very low frequency, it looks just like this uh, uh, theoretical open. But uh, there is an internal delay inside the open, so you get this arc on the screen. And this is typical. Uh, so I can tell that my, uh, that my calibration is good. Uh, if it had gone many, many times around the screen, then I would have a problem. All right, so I've demonstrated how easy it is to, uh, to do this. I've moved the bridge now outside the VNA. Uh, and uh, there are quite a number of applications for, uh, for that, which I will go over now. So uh, in this case, as I mentioned before, uh, I might have a preamp, uh, and, but I'm only interested in measuring the PA. So I would uh, use this uh, direct receiver access with this external coupler, uh, the, the PA would be removed. Uh, and I would, uh, I would perform calibration uh, in between these two arrows, uh, the output of the coupler and uh, perhaps the, the side of the attenuator. It's very important to note that if you use a, a large attenuator on one port, you cannot do a full two-port calibration because the VNA needs to be able to measure reflections on this side. And if you put open shorts and loads here, you really won't see any difference on the other side because the signals have to go twice through the attenuator. And if it's a 20 dB attenuator, they'll be 40 dB down, and that's way too far down uh, to be able to perform calibration. You could probably get away with 10 dB here. And that's about it. And if you and even then your your calibration will be a little noisy. If you need a big, atten a big attenuator, say 20 or 30 dB, uh, you can calibrate, but you have to do two-port, one-path calibration. And that's one of the choices that's uh, built into the VNA. Uh, you would select that, and it would do a full one-port calibration at this point, and it would do uh, basically a through calibration through here. Uh, and the attenuation would be removed, uh, and you'd have a pretty good measurement. Not quite as good as a full two-port, but not too bad either. So this is how we measure uh, using an external bridge uh, in the midst of a signal chain uh, when we only want to measure perhaps the return loss of a PA. Here is another situation. This is called a hot S22 measurement. Here we have a PA, and we want to measure its uh, output impedance, its output reflection coefficient, S22, and we need to do that while the PA is running, while, it has, while it's actually amplifying a signal because uh, the characteristics of the PA will change uh, with and without uh, a signal passing through it. So we set an external frequency synthesizer to a frequency that is not the same as the frequency where we're going to measure the impedance. If it were the same, it would mess up the measurement. So we'll set the frequency synthesizer 5, 10 megahertz away, just to make sure that the, uh, uh, that the phase noise tail, uh, which will be here on the output of the PA, uh, is, isn't uh, within the, uh, the measurement of the, isn't within the measurement frequency at, at S22. So here's how it's set up. Uh, we have this frequency synthesizer, perhaps 5, 10 megahertz away. We have our PA, we have our, our bridge now, which is here on the output of the PA. Uh, we may then, uh, depending on the power level, the output of the PA, we may need to add pads such that uh, the signal level into the, uh, into the receivers is minus 3 dBm maximum. If you go greater than that, uh, you're going to start compressing the receivers and your errors will uh, increase or your measurement will not be accurate. So these have to be chosen judiciously to uh, make sure that these, uh, these two signals uh, the input to the receivers are uh, less than minus three. Then the output of the PA through the coupler, uh, this is fairly low loss. We need an attenuator to prevent uh, damage to port two. 
Uh, we could also use an isolator. A good isolator might provide 25 dB of isolation, uh, add an attenua a 10 dB attenuator here, uh, and uh, you'd be in pretty good shape. You could probably do a full two-port calibration as long as this was only 10 dB. Uh, and then, uh, but I, I'm sorry, in this case, uh, we're only measuring S22, so it's only a one-port calibration anyway. But, um, uh, but we do need enough signal in order to do that. And what you can do, uh, you could actually put a preamp on the output of port two uh, to boost the signal level. Uh, that'll pass through the isolator. Uh, it'll come out the attenuator at a higher level, and uh, and then uh, and then it will. Um, see the PA impedance and you'll, you'll see the reflection from the PA here, you'll see the incident signal here, and, uh, and you should be able to get a good S22 measurement. Meanwhile, the PA is lit up by the, this input signal here, uh, and uh, this is an accurate way of making what's called a hot S22 measurement. Uh, it takes a judicious choice of attenuators here and, one, and on the output and perhaps a circulator and amplifier. It's a little bit of work to set up. The next application is a hot cable measurement. Uh, in the broadcast industry, uh, there are uh, large antennas, uh, perhaps on antenna farms, and there are co-located transmitters, such that if you try to measure uh, the signal uh, uh, at the end of your cable, uh, there could be some very, very large signals uh, coming your way from other sources. Uh, if you attach that directly to the, uh, to the port of the VNA, you could damage it. So you have to isolate the VNA from those hot signals, and this is how one could do it. Uh, use port one through a, a power amplifier to boost the signal up, perhaps an attenuator to help protect the output of the PA from these signals, uh, and then you go through the coupler and out to the antenna. Returning, actual returning signals that the VNA wants to see uh, will pass through the coupler, and you'll be able to see uh, on, the, uh, on the couple ports uh, we boosted the, the signal up some, so they're going to be a little easier to see, uh, and perhaps uh, made them uh, louder than the uh, than the returning signal. So we're um, you know we're getting our signal to noise ratio in, in, uh, improved by doing that, but we have to make sure that uh, this is still minus three dBm maximum into the uh, receiver. So doing this uh, prevents us prevents these loud. Uh, interfering spurious signals from going directly into the uh, VNA. It has to pass through the coupling of the coupler, it's 20 dB, and it has to pass through whatever attenuator that I have to put in here, and so there's at least a 20 dB drop uh, to the, uh, to the uh, input of the VNA, and that should protect it if you do this correctly. Uh, and uh, as it says here, we would perform a one-port calibration uh, right here on the output of this coupler. Uh, this method is used extensively for, uh, for measuring broadcast antennas uh, and antennas at, at other sites where, uh, where the site is very busy. Um, one, can, uh, one can use this actually uh, to use, we can use the time domain feature of the VNA to measure re return loss over distance, which is very handy because sometimes uh, uh, a broadcast cable will blow out. Uh, it'll arc over and then once that's happened, uh, it carbonizes and really the, the cable is no good anymore. Uh, but it's difficult to ascertain where the damage is, uh, but doing uh, the time domain analysis, perhaps with this setup, allows you to zero in on the location of the damage very quickly and then uh, get the repair people to fix it. Uh, and I should mention that the time domain feature is standard with all of our models except for our M series. And the last application I might mention here, uh, I did say that uh, if you're going around the bridge, you get about a 15 to 20 dB uh, signal to noise improvement. Uh, you do not get a dynamic range improvement because the compression moves level moves down with it. But if you're only looking at small signals, uh, you can see them, uh, this will give you some improvement because the, uh, the signals will be a little, little bigger now. Uh, this might be the case where you have, uh, you're feeding one signal you're doing an S21 measurement only here, uh, and this signal, uh, perhaps this antenna is isolated from the uh, source antenna, and you're looking at a reflection from a distant object coming back, sort of like a radar situation, uh, and the reflection's quite small. 
uh, hooking it up in this fashion will, uh, will result in a, a 15 dB improvement. You'll, you'll see signals that are much farther down. So this is just the last uh, application I can think of. I'm sure there are a lot more, uh, but, uh, uh, but that just about covers all the applications that I know of for direct receiver access. I hope this is informative. Uh, and I hope you understand now how easy it is to, uh, to do this, and I hope you're no longer afraid to remove the loops and make use of it. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you for listening.